The Second Chances Chapter 1 Sir Walter Elliot Situated in Somerset, southwest England, Kelling Hall was the abode of Sir Walter Elliot, a man deeply engrossed in the annals of the baronage. His literary pursuits centered solely around the pages chronicling his own lineage. Born on the 1st of March, 1760, Sir Walter, a baronet, tied the knot with Elizabeth Stevenson on the 15th of July, 1784. Their union brought forth three daughters. Elizabeth, born on the 1st of June, 1785, Anne, gracing the world on the 9th of August, 1787, and Mary, entering life's stage on the 20th of November, 1791. The family tree continued with Mary's marriage to Charles Musgrove on the 16th of December, 1810. A somber note echoed through the years with the birth and demise of a stillborn son on the 5th of November, 1789. The matriarch, Lady Elliot, bid farewell to life in 1800. Gazing towards the future, the heir presumptive loomed in the form of William Walter Elliot, the great-grandson of the second Sir Walter. The family narrative seamlessly transitioned into a historical account spanning three hundred years, a tapestry of respectability that brought immense satisfaction to Sir Walter. Vanity stood as his predominant trait, a quality he indulged in concerning both his aristocratic lineage and his enduring good looks. At fifty-four, Sir Walter remained a handsome figure, a fact that astonished his acquaintances, considering his decision not to enter the bonds of matrimony again. Despite the opportunity to propose to Lady Russell, a widow residing nearby, and a close friend of the late Lady Elliot, thirteen years had elapsed since Lady Elliot's demise, and Sir Walter and Lady Russell retained only a cordial friendship. Elizabeth, Sir Walter's favored daughter, at the age of twenty-nine, still possessed a striking allure. Anne, aged twenty-six, had once been deemed beautiful, but now appeared pale and slender. In contrast, Mary had experienced a transformation, growing plump since her union with Charles Musgrove. Deep lines etched around Lady Russell's eyes, yet Sir Walter reveled in the belief that, among those known to him, only he and Elizabeth retained their timeless attractiveness. Persistently, Sir Walter harbored the notion that Elizabeth would marry a distinguished nobleman, oblivious to the repetitive nature of this contemplation over the past thirteen years. At sixteen, Elizabeth had envisioned matrimony with her father's heir, William Walter Elliot, as the sole means to secure the family's estate. Although impressed by the young man when he was invited to Kelling Hall, he never honored the invitation. A year later, he wedded a wealthy woman from a middle-class background, leaving Elizabeth aggrieved and adrift. Her subsequent years were marked by attendance at elegant soirees and visits with friends, a futile attempt to fill the void, given her lack of talents or interests. Presently, concerns over her father's mounting debts added to her worries, a financial puzzle neither she nor Sir Walter could fathom. Unified in their belief that an opulent lifestyle was integral to the dignity of a noble family, Lady Russell and Anne 
dedicated hours to devising plans for frugality, all of which were summarily dismissed by Sir Walter. Eventually, he embraced the radical proposal of relocating to the town of B, where he could maintain his status with the diminished expenses. Concurrently, Kelling Hall found a temporary tenant in Admiral Croft. Following the completion of business dealings between Sir Walter's lawyer, Mr. Shepherd, and Admiral Croft, the former visited Kelling to apprise Sir Walter of the arrangements. Admiral Croft is quite amiable, Mr. Shepherd reported. His wife's brother resided in the nearby village of Monkford a few years ago. Perhaps you're acquainted with the gentleman. Now, what was his name? Mr. Shepherd grappled with his memory, unable to recall the name of Mrs. Croft's brother. He resided in the Greystone house and supplied after a brief pause. I believe you're referring to Mr. Wentworth. Ah, Sir Walter remarked, the curate of Monkford. When you mentioned gentleman, I presumed you meant a man of property, someone of nobility. Mr. Wentworth was inconsequential. Anne silently exited the room, finding solace in the garden as she meandered among the towering trees. Her thoughts drifted to the possibility of Captain Frederick Wentworth's arrival in a few months. He was the brother of the curate in Monkford, and had spent the year 1806 there. A charming and clever naval officer, Captain Wentworth had captured Anne's heart when she was a gentle, sensitive girl. Despite a period of happiness, their love faced opposition when Sir Walter disapproved of the proposed union. Anne's gentle and sensible nature, traits admired by Lady Russell, had led her to break off the engagement. Captain Wentworth, hurt and angered, embarked on a naval career, and eight years had passed since. Unbeknownst to Anne, Captain Wentworth had achieved success in the Navy, amassing wealth but remaining unmarried. Lady Russell's cautionary advice now appeared excessively prudent, leaving Anne to ponder the choices that had altered the course of her life. Mary, residing at Upper Cross, three miles from Kelling Hall, requested Anne's assistance when Elizabeth and Sir Walter departed for Bath. Anne readily accepted the invitation, finding solace in the countryside close to Lady Russell. However, apprehensions arose concerning the extended stay of Mrs. Clay, a pleasant yet single woman, with Elizabeth and Sir Walter in Bath and voiced her concerns to Elizabeth, who dismissed them, asserting that her father harbored no attraction for Mrs. Clay, given her lack of noble lineage. With Sir Walter, Elizabeth, and Mrs. Clay's departure for Bath, and relocated to Mary's residence. The two sisters, although not known for enjoying each other's company, found an accord in the value and brought to Mary's household. However, Anne remained wary of the prolonged stay of the amiable Mrs. Clay in Bath, foreseeing potential complications in the proximity to Sir Walter. In the cottage, the smaller of the two houses on the Musgrove property, and, and Mary spent considerable time with Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove and their vivacious daughters, Harrietta and Louisa. 
The sisters' lively camaraderie and shared affection stood in stark contrast to Anne's relationships with her own sisters, evoking a sense of longing for a connection that had eluded her. Chapter 2 Captain Wentworth Upon the arrival of Admiral Croft and his wife at Kelling Hall, Mary and Charles extended a warm invitation to the cottage, where the Musgrove family, along with their daughters, joined in the festivities. Dear Mrs. Croft, Mrs. Musgrove exclaimed once introductions were complete, did you know that my son Dick served in the Navy under your brother, Captain Frederick Wentworth? Indeed? inquired Mrs. Croft. And what does your son do now? Alas, the poor boy perished at sea, Mrs. Musgrove lamented, tears welling in her eyes. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that, consoled Mrs. Croft. Unbeknownst to Mrs. Musgrove, Dick Musgrove had been a troublesome young man both at home and in the Navy. His demise at the age of twenty, two years prior, elicited genuine grief only from his mother. Mrs. Croft, a sensible and forthright lady, attempted to comfort Mrs. Musgrove. My brother will be pleased to meet you, Mrs. Musgrove said. His naval career has been a resounding success, and now that the war has concluded, his return to England. He shall be staying with us at Kelling Hall next week. And, overhearing this, felt her heart quicken with anxiety. The following week, Harrietta and Louisa paid a visit to Anne and Mary at the cottage. We've encountered Captain Wentworth. Harrietta exclaimed. He's remarkably handsome and charming. Father has invited him for dinner this evening. Yes. Added Louisa. You must all come to meet him. I'm afraid we can't, Mary interjected. My little boy has a cold, and we must stay with him this evening. Well, I can go, can't I, Charles? Inquired Mary. If you wish, replied Charles, evidently displeased that his wife preferred leaving his side. You both can go, and suggested. I'll stay here with little Charles. What a splendid idea! Mary exclaimed, suddenly buoyant. As Charles and Mary departed for the great house, and remained at the cottage, contemplating the impending dinner where Captain Wentworth would be engaging with others. How does he feel about our meeting again? And pondered. Sooner or later, it must happen. Perhaps he is indifferent, or maybe he'll be embarrassed. In all these years, he has never attempted to contact me. Late into the night, Charles and Mary returned, brimming with enthusiasm for Captain Wentworth. Such a friendly young man, Mary remarked. Captain Wentworth wasn't very polite to you, and, she added. As we left the house, Harrietta inquired about your impression, and he remarked, she's changed so much that I hardly recognized her. Mary, oblivious to the impact of her words, remained unaware of the pain they inflicted on her sister. It must be true and thought, but he hasn't changed. He's just as good-looking as ever. 
While his comment stung, it also imparted a sense of calm. If I have changed so much, unreasoned, there is no hope for him to love me as he did before. So be calm, she advised herself. If you can be calm, you will be content. Surprised by Harrietta's query, Captain Wentworth had spoken the truth. Yet, he hadn't anticipated anyone repeating his words to Anne. He harbored no forgiveness for her. She had abandoned him, displaying a perceived weakness of character. Despite having loved her intensely, he never found another woman who matched her. Arriving at Kelling with newfound wealth after a successful naval career, he sought a settled life with an attractive young woman. Excluding Anne from the realm of possibilities. When questioned by his sister about his intentions, he nonchalantly declared, I'm here, Sophia, to find a wife. Any young lady can capture me with a little beauty, a few smiles, and a few compliments about the Navy. However, in a more serious conversation, he outlined his desire for a wife possessing both strength of mind and a sweet demeanor. And, once everything to him, now found herself in Captain Wentworth's company frequently though never alone with him. Hours passed in shared spaces, listening to his voice without close scrutiny or intimate conversation. Once united in profound affection, they now stood as mere acquaintances. Tell us about your sea adventures, Captain Wentworth, Louisa requested one evening. You mentioned your first ship, the ASP. Did you encounter any adventures on the ASP? Certainly, replied the captain. It was in 1806. That year, with a strong desire to go to sea, the Navy assigned me to the ASP. An aged yet formidable vessel, we captured a French ship that autumn and brought it into Plymouth Harbor. As we approached Plymouth, a ferocious storm besieged us for four days. The ASP, already worn from our clashes with the French, seemed destined for a watery grave. I thought, we'll likely descend together to the depths of the sea this time. Fortunately, she proved a sturdy old ship, and we reached port unscathed. Harrietta and Louisa gasped in sympathy and horror, while and shuddered at the grim prospect of him sinking to the seas of this. Your subsequent ship was the Laconia, wasn't it? Mrs. Musgrove inquired. Indeed. How fortunate for us. Frederick appeared perplexed until Harrietta whispered, She's referring to my brother Dick. Ah, acknowledged Frederick, his expression revealing to her that memories of Dick were not of a joyous nature. Detectable only by someone who knew him well, a fleeting look crossed his face. He moved across the room, seating himself beside Mrs. Musgrove, engaging in a hushed and serious conversation about her departed son. As Anne sat on the other side of Mrs. Musgrove, she couldn't help but think, we're on the same sofa. However, when Captain Wentworth rose to depart, he bid and farewell with a chilly politeness, akin to someone scarcely acquainted, saying, good evening. 